I know, vague, and it's like, yeah, everyone here is like, yeah, duh. And I'm like, oh, good, then we're on the same page. But the funny thing is, more often than not, for me, a lot of times, God will use me, and not just on Sunday mornings, but I mean, he'll actually bring people to me um, outside of this place, one-on-one, which I'm really horrible and awkward at. Great up here in front of you, because no one's talking back to me. And I'm in my comfort zone. I've got my nice safety blanket of a big microphone, a loud voice, and my laptop. But when it's one-on-one, I'm not expecting it. I go stupid. And um, more often than not, though, it's at the gym for whatever reason. Because I think it's just because people, for me, are just like-minded. They're there for a similar goal and some sort of path that just has a lot of similarities and comparisons. And they're drawn to certain things, and they come up to you. And I get really insecure about that, and I tend to, to, to kind of close myself off at times because of the insecurity and draw back. And as I was praying one day, God said, well, what if it's not that they're just seeking after you, but if you actually believe what you've been praying for, they're seeking after me, and you've asked me to bring people to you, and you're closing it down. See, it's not them coming to you for you, but what if it's them coming to you because they want to get to me, and me in you is trying to do that, but you're closing it down because your insecurity is thinking they're just coming to you for you. And I said, okay, letting it go, and that has to be a decision I have to make every single day because I don't want to come off stupid in my insecurities. And then I was challenged with this. And I'm not going to say this is of God, this is just something I was challenged with. One of my mentors that I've been listening to, and then one of the things that came to me as I was praying, and I had to share it with Melody last week, because it was just like God's poking me with a cattle prod, just, just do it, just go, just do it. And he says, I'm not saying that this is going to happen, but I want you to do something. And the words that came to me were, dream big. I said, okay. So what does it look like? He says, I don't know, ask me. I'm like, well, that's the stupidest thing I've heard, but thank you, I guess I'll do that. So I asked him, and you know what's funny? Every morning when I come here on Sundays, I take Ogden off Stony, and I drive past this old legion that's just down around the corner that's this empty, gigantic building. I, and I was almost kind of sarcastically in a frustrated but a very passionate way as something was happening. I said, okay, God, you want me to dream big? I want this church that we are a part of to grow so big and become such a strong movement of Jesus Christ where people's lives are changed by an actual encounter with a supernatural God that we outgrow this building, have to rent it out, and we have to buy that one. Now, again, I'm not saying that's going to happen, but I'm just saying I am not going to, I'm going to strive to not let my insecurities about people coming to me stop me from being an instrument wherever God wants to use me and place me, and I'm not going to let a building limit what God can do or be the end-all, be-all of what God can do. See, the thing is, so often we talk as church or the structure, but it is actually the people in it. This is not the encapsulation of God, which is why so many people say, well, God lives there. I have to go visit him on Sundays, and then I'm going to go back home and be me. But unfortunately, that's the way it was in the ancient world. That's pre-Christ. The temple was supposed to be the actual housing of God, but no more. And we need to change the mentality of how we see ourselves in the presence of God today. So Mark chapter 13, I'm going to go through two verses and I'm going to go back to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 13, verse 1 says, As he was going out of the temple, which is Jesus Christ, who's just finished these moments we've gone over the last couple of weeks of seeing this one man step forward who was a scholar who thought he knew all about the scriptures of teaching it, but saw that there's something different about Jesus and he had the idea that, well, I don't believe in you. I'm not going to give you all that I am, but I want to approach you and have an engagement with me because there's something about you that I want to test the waters with and he did and Christ allowed it which is something we need to learn to let people come to God in their own time in their own way and let God speak to them and meet them where they are at and then he asked what is the greatest thing that I can be doing and Jesus says I want you to want to love God with all that you are your passions your desires your emotions your appetites, your character, yourself, your will, your intellect, the things that stimulate you, I want that to be a part of your faith, not just following out of religious obedience, but having a moment with God where you can't help but want to be with Him because He's engaging all of you. And then in the next moment, the rest of the group that this one man came from come forward and He says, be careful of these people. Talk about knowing your audience, but then doing the opposite of insulting them. These hypocrites, these liars think they know me, but they know nothing about me. And then he compares these group of wealthy religious scholars who give out of their absolute abundance. He says, look at this woman who is giving out of absolute necessity because she has nothing left. 
but she chooses to give all she has because she's been changed by Christ. And so often we see that like, oh, it's about tithing. I need to give more money. And we use this as some sort of obligation for people to open their wallets and throw money at whatever church ministry you're doing. No, it's about someone who is so encapsulated by the character of God, they want to give all that they have. And Jesus is talking about the character issue. She is someone so encapsulated with God, she wants to give all that she has. And everything that she does, it's not about giving the money, it's about she's been completely consumed by the character of Jesus Christ. And after this moment, Jesus is leaving and he's going out of the temple. And one of his disciples, one of his close companions says to him, Teacher, behold what wonderful stones, what wonderful buildings. And Jesus says to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left upon another which will not be torn down. Why is this important? Because culturally, the temple in those days is the only place where God resides. When King David had these architect designs and God said, you can design it, but your son will build it. It's going to be this legacy that's beyond you. It's more than you. Solomon's going to build this temple that's going to house God. Think about that. I mean, again, and this is the history of a people who were enslaved for 400 years and God sends this one guy who stutters and used to be an Egyptian royalty but no longer is and now he's a Hebrew and now he's come to save his people and he's got horrible speech. And God says, you go alone and trust that I won't let you die. And he goes and these plagues come and the people are liberated and they part the sea. They walk across, they're fed, they're given water. They wander for 40 years before they find this promised land. They get into the promised land, they build a temple. The temple's supposed to be the housing of God. But the thing is, the temple wasn't the absolute epitome of the presence of God. God says, no, I want you to build an ark. And if you've ever seen Indiana Jones, you have a good idea of what it looked like. And I'm a visual guy, so I love Indiana Jones. And he says, don't touch it. Do not touch the ark. You can't touch it. You'll die. Not because God is so cruel, because he's actually caring about it. He says, I'm so good and perfect, and I want to be close with you, but if you even are in my presence at times, and you've got something that's broken about you, which we all do, it's the human nature, you'll die, and I don't want you to die. I want you to be close to me as best you can, and I want you to have a sacrificial system where you're offering up these animals as, as a temporary means of covering the sins and the brokenness in your life. And sins is this religious word that actually means anything that causes brokenness or distance in the relationship we have with God, with others, and ourselves, which is a lot of things. And that temporarily it can be healed so you can come as close as you can and you have a specific group of people that actually are mediums between you and I that can represent you, stand before me for a moment, come back out and the glory will be on them, the presence, the residue of where I've been will be on them and hopefully will impact you. And now Jesus is saying this place is going to be destroyed. The problem is though, not only is that something that would just be such a, a culturally shocking statement it has a lot of truth and actually goes deeper than that because the temple now, at this point in history where Jesus is, doesn't have the ark. The ark's been gone for a long time, which means that the presence of God and the thing that he told them to build is no longer around, which means that the temple is actually not doing its job anymore. And if it's not doing its job and it's nothing more than a religious institution and, and it's nothing more than a shadow of what it's supposed to be, it doesn't serve a purpose and it will be torn down because Jesus is not here for us to stand in buildings, worship idols and icons, and just simply, simply be. It's Jesus is more than that. He's saying, I'm going to encapsulate, complete everything that you've put your hope in before. I'm going to change the entire rhythm and system that you've grown up in. And ironically, it was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD under Emperor Nero. When the Jewish nation said, I have, I've had enough of this Roman occupation. Let's rise up and push them out. And they couldn't. And then they got choked. They got pissed. They came back and destroyed the one thing that meant something to them in the hopes of castrating any sort of movement of rebellion in the future. And it did. See, G Jesus' statement here threatens current existence. See, far too often, even in today's day and age, we look at the building, we're like, oh, that building is so good. That building is where I want to be. That church has all this money and all these programs and has a nice siding on the outside and a brand new roof, which we need, and God's going to provide one, one way somehow. But it's just a building. 
No longer do we live in the days where we need to go to the temple to be cleansed. We have Jesus in our lives, which means that it's already been completed and he's there. We come together in a building to worship and that's it. That is it. There's nothing special that comes in here. We don't have to voodoo chant, shake our incense, and then, uh, I don't know, incantations and rituals. We just don't do that. I mean, some people do, but they don't need to. That's not what it's about, right? Jesus threatens the current existence but offers a new way. See, all this foreshadowing even reverts back to when Jesus said, see the temple? Tear it down in three days. I will build it again. What he's saying, what they didn't get at the time is, I'm going to complete the works that you cannot complete on your own. I'm going to do it for you. I'm going to offer it up as a completed work for you. So you no longer have to come here. You no longer have to do these things. It's been done. Receive. Embrace. Embrace. In order to understand this statement better, we have to go back to Mark chapter 1, verse 9. And this is the start of Jesus' ministry when he actually comes in those days. And verse 9 says, He came to the Jordan from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John, his cousin, in the Jordan River. Immediately coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opening and a spirit like a dove descending upon him. And a voice came out of the heavens, You are my beloved Son, and you I am well pleased. And immediately the Spirit impelled him to go. There's a few things you have to look at here, what's going on. He saw the heavens open up as he comes up out of the water out of baptism. And here comes this, this dove-like figure, which is the Holy Spirit descending upon him. And then a voice from heaven speaks. Now Jesus isn't the only one hearing this voice. And at this point, John has gathered such an uprising and such a buzz around what he's doing that even the religious leaders in Jerusalem are saying, we need to go investigate because this is technically our job. Is this guy full of BS or not? Okay, we're going to take our BS meter, we're going to take our, our, our Bible, we're going to go and we're going we're gonna to monitor, you know. Beep, beep, beep. Problem is, if we had that meter, a lot of churches would go off too nowadays, wouldn't they? Anyway, so they get there and they see John and they're questioning him. And what I love about John the Baptist is a side note, he's just this, this rebel. He doesn't fit the ideal standards of what a representative of faith should be. And I love that because too often we think of this prim, proper, slightly balding, but still has the bad comb over, the hair slicked back guy. He's in middle age to late 50s. He um, doesn't curse, doesn't drink, doesn't see movies that are over a G rating. And it's just like, I'm, I'm judging myself by these standards. I'm like, fail, 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 fail. I mean, here's the thing. When I was in Bible college, one of the things they wanted to have us do in order to actually be accepted into the program is to sign this statement of purity. And I was like, this is a purity covenant? What's happening here? And I was reading through it, and it's got the fine print that nobody ever reads, but I chose to, so I took half an hour. I will not watch any movies over PG rating. I will not drink. I will not this. I'm just like, I'm a, and because I'm a bit of a rebel rouser, and I like to stir the pot, I remembered instantly, well, I, I attended an Anglican church at the time, and, and we're more traditional, so instead of grape juice, we had wine. So I'm like, well, I attend an Anglican church and we drink wine with our communion. What do you think about that? And I'm being a little, little turd for sure. And they had to actually have a meeting and pray about it. You know, that church, we got to go pray about it to see if it's still okay. I'm like, well, you better go pray then. And they came back and I never signed the thing ever again. But the thing is, that's what you see. John the Baptist also doesn't meet that criteria. He comes from a lineage and actually is a descendant upon Aaron who actually were born into identity of you are a temple worker. You don't have a choice. This is your legacy and you should be proud to have it. You are here. That's his mom's side. His dad was somebody who worked in the temple already, so he had this double standard expectation. You are our child foretold to do something good by an angel of God. But in their minds, it's going to be in the temple because the temple's the only place where God works. Where do we find John the Baptist? He's wearing camel skin in the desert, eating locusts and honey. This is not something that's prim and proper. He did not have all the status and wealth that those type of people in that time should have had. So he would have been judged, rejected, and I bet you he would have had daddy issues as well. Why are you not following in my footsteps? Because I'm not you, Dad. And thank God, because I would have made a horrible firefighter. That would have been... The... My dad has stories that still keep me up at night. John the Baptist, cousin of Jesus, which... And he's out there, and all these people are attracted to what John's doing, and then John stops, and he looks, and says, Behold, here comes the one. 
And then Jesus comes. So all these people who were not there for Jesus, they were there for something else, see Jesus go in the water, come back up. A dove comes down from the sky like, oh, this is strange because we're in the desert. And then a voice from the heavens starts shouting down saying, this is my beloved son whom I love with whom I am well pleased. And everyone just evacuated their bowels in amazement and they were like, oh, this is God speaking. I should probably take notice. But the thing is what we do not understand here is what God is quoting is three different portions of Old Testament scripture into one statement. Let me break this down for you. You are my son, comes from Psalm 2, verse 7. He said to me, you are my son, today I have become your father, meaning that there's an intimate relationship between this voice that is speaking and this man whom he's speaking to, so that all people understand who he is. Verse 2. Whom I love comes from Genesis 22.2. Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering in one of the mountains, and I will tell you about it. This is one of those stories we grew up with. What he's also saying here is, yes, I love him, but I may or may not also associate his identity with ultimate sacrifice. There's foreshadowing of the death of Jesus Christ from the start of his ministry. The third part, whom I am well pleased comes from Isaiah 42, 1. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations, a man of hope. This is a loaded statement. The thing is, we don't understand this because we are not Jewish people 2,000 years ago in a different culture, in a different language. Everybody standing there would have been raised in a type of education that they would have instantly got this and thought, holy cow, this voice is saying that this is the one we've been hoping for and I just happened to be here in the desert hanging out on a Saturday. I had nothing else to do. God doesn't work here. He's supposed to be in the temple. But God was silent for 400 years before Jesus stepped foot outside of the temple and said, this place is going to be torn to the ground. 400 years of silence between God using someone to speak to his people and then John the Baptist hits the scene and says, here is the one. The thing is, when, when God is silent in our lives though, we tend to cleave to the things that we have connection with. You come to church because it's something you can do, right? It's not a bad thing, but it's just human nature. You, you take part in the ministries and you try and do offering or whatever it may be because it's something you can actually do in hopes that it will kickstart God's motivation to speak up again and stop being silent. Where are you? What are you doing? I gotta do something. And God's like, it's just a time of quiet. You're like, I hate time out. I hate nap time. Figure it out and get back to me now. But this is the one who's saying it. He is my son. He is God. He's also the ultimate sacrifice that is coming to liberate you, bring hope, and to serve you. The thing is, though, okay, people in that day and age looked at the Old Testament in three portions. The Torah, the first five books, which was quoted in Genesis. The Psalms, which God quoted from the Psalms. And also the prophets, which God quoted in the prophets as a part of his statement about who Jesus was. He's also saying that he is the completion of the entire scriptures. Take note. And when God speaks to us in that way, see that, that's what's so cool about God. We can't limit what God can or cannot do in other people's lives, right? Because he's so good at connecting with me and getting my attention through so many different avenues and things that he just speaks through different things, whether it's a movie or music or karaoke. Like on Thursday, I said to Don, I said, listen, you're coming out to karaoke, which I do as a part-time job. And I said, I want you to sing Evanescence, Bring Me to Life. That song really was registering in my life and it was something that I thought was a cry of worship unto the nation and the city we live in. Now, I don't normally preach or anything like that at karaoke because it doesn't go over well and it would cost me my job and I'm not there for that. But God has done something amidst that. Anyways, but Don did it and I'm sitting there like an idiot praising with my hands up and my eyes closed and the whole bar is erupting and singing with us and there was a powerful moment of this declaration of I need you to bring me to life whether they knew it or not. But it's those type of things that God can use to get somebody a moment A moment in time where he speaks to us through whatever avenue it may be, whether it's art or poetry or whatever it is. I mean, sometimes it's even these ridiculous messages that I grew up with that turn or burn. Oh my God, I need Jesus because he loves me so much. He doesn't want to send me to the hell he created for me. It's like, oh my gosh. 
we need to get rid of that, but whatever avenue it may be that he gets a hold of us, we need to allow that for other people because he's good at it. And he's saying, this, this guy here, pay attention, take note. This Jesus, accredited by God in front of other people as filled with the Holy Spirit, the completion of Scripture, absolute hope, he lives in you. And loves you, which means we no longer need to be doing anything. We no longer have to be focused on a building or whatever it may be, any sort of religious routine. We don't have to focus on it. We don't have to participate. We don't have to do it. All we have to do is choose to love him and want to love him with all that we are and let him work in our lives and see what happens. It's a science experiment. It's a step of faith because we are never guaranteed it's going to play out the way we think. And that's okay. I'm still struggling with that. My wife surely does. A type personality. <laughs> you know, because it seems, it seems like sometimes something's happening and life is going this way. And then all of a sudden, third period hockey battle of Alberta happens and the Flames score two more goals and really embarrass your team. Amen. You, yes, I, I thought I had to dig that in there, Bob, because you were chirping so hard last night, and then you went silent, and I couldn't figure out why. <laughs> Humility! I'm going to get struck pretty soon, and I'm going to get it right back, but I've got to get it in because i got the mic. So, this, this is who God is, and this is what he wants, right? It's just, you, you, things might look like they're going this way, but God's plan, which he's very clear about in Scripture, is always to prosper, not to harm. Life is going to suck, and, and again, to reiterate these things that have been coming to me, which I've really struggled with, is we often pray, Lord, give me your strength, but we never pray, let it be in my complete broken, brokenness, where I can't do anything else for myself. Make me lie down in green pastures, because I'm in this close to actual death, and bring me back to health. Restore my soul because I'm so worn out. We, we always forget the former and skip right to the latter. Let it be easy. I don't want this garbage anymore. And God says, I have to refine you with fire. The thing is, Scripture tells us, which really ticks me off, rejoice in sufferings because they give character development. I'm like, you need to shut up. Peter, Paul, shush, zip. You don't understand what I'm going through. And then there's Jesus, and he always, he always confronts me, and he says, okay, well, what are you going through? Well, I'm feeling rejected. He says, yeah, I had my 12 closest companions leave me to die. Okay. Well, I'm physically hurt. I was whipped and torn apart. And they hung on a cross with my exposed spine with every breath struggling. And I did it because I love you, and I chose to stay on there because I love you. And I'm like, okay, you win. I get it. I submit. Thank you very much for winning. But these are the type of things is that what I love about Jesus Christ is that everything he's gone through as a person was to not only lead by example, but to be able to relate to everything and anything we go through because he gives the darn about you. Really got to watch myself. I'm getting, you know. And when God thrusts new identity upon you with the Holy Spirit, you will be impelled to go. Jesus, after this moment, where everyone hears his identity placed upon him by God, is impelled to go. The thing is, God is going to use you where you're at, no matter what situation in life you are at. If he's saying go, you're going to be, I can't help but go. He brings these people to me for these conversations that I absolutely dread, and something is happening. I'm a pastor to three or four people at my gym, not because I sought after it, because he brought them to me, and not because I preach at them, because I relate to them in love, and they say, I love Jesus Christ because of what you're showing me. And I'm like, don't put that on me, that's him. You know, and it's, but that's the way it is, and that's so good. I love that. And there's such hope in that. And that's, that's what makes it worthwhile. If you have a connection that actually means something, has impact on you, and then you have relationships with other people in response to that initial relationship and connection, that is God at work. It's not religious people saying, stop doing this, do this, five Hail Marys, you're good with me, you're square with God, continue living in absolute uncertainty. Amen, thus saith the Lord. Ta-ta, tutu, mm -hmm. time to collect money. It's not like that at all. But people get more comfortable in religion and the religious institutions and rituals of the past because that's something we can grab hold of. And Jesus says, if it's not a means to an end, 
it doesn't serve a purpose anymore. If the building doesn't house God, doesn't house the people of God, it is standing there not fulfilling its purpose. If we are standing here no longer without God at work in our lives, we are not fulfilling who we are meant to be. And not because God says, do what I say because I say it. Do what I say and come to me because I love you and it's what's best for you. In a sense of not losing yourself in the identity of God, but Him amplifying all the things He gave you in the first place and removing the brokenness that is confined and absolutely deformed us in our past and saying, you are new. Go, I impel you to go, go. Be what you cannot be on your own. Become what you, who you could not become on your own. And this is what's so crazy, you know, in Acts, you've got the story of Peter starting the church and then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit comes down and there's thousands of people every day, thousands of people each day encountering God wanting to come and be a part of this movement and they have no idea what it's going to look like. They are completely destroying the rhythms and, and the, the steps, step-by-step -step instructions of every Bible college known to man. You need to have a plan. Nope, I'll tell you what. My plan is trust God, let him lead. And it really ticks people off because it sounds like you don't know what you're doing. The truth is, I don't. I'm just following in obedience and here we are every week and nobody has died yet under my watch, so thank God for that. But the thing is, if we let God lead, and I mean this church in particular because that's who we are and that's what we're doing, He is bringing new people and doing new things and that is actually something worth happening. I'm so sick of mega churches trying to control what is and what will be. And I'm not saying all of them, because some of them are really good, but my experience, the bigger the church, the more the institution needs to take hold to control. And I'm like, no, let go. There's Peter, has no idea what he's doing, has Jesus, and there's all these people that need healing in the book of Acts, and he's like, I don't have time to pray for all these people. And God's like, I got you covered. The sun starts to set, Peter's shadow extends, he walks by people, and by the thousands they're healed because Paul's, Peter's shadow simply touches them. Not because Peter's so good, but God's like, I'm in you, time to work. And he, like, swiffers everyone into cleanliness, and it was just, just insane to me. I've never had that. I've never walked by someone and been like, hey, did you touch my shadow? How do you feel? You sound like a nutcase. I do that enough on my own. Have you seen my family? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Peter just simply was there and was usable. But Peter had a new identity. And God said, let's use that in strange and unusual ways. And he does. Because he works good and unusual in the damaged good areas of our lives and that of other people. See, the temple was never built or designed to limit God. But it became that. It was meant to be a beacon of hope to the world because he was with his people. And when that temple lost its purpose, he changed it. And it's the same thing with us. We're never meant to be a barrier between God and other people. We are meant to be living beacons of hope and representations of actually who Jesus is, not what we're taught about him, not just head knowledge, but in character, action. We're not meant to live and limit in, in God's connection with other people. We're meant to be vessels of the living, revolutionary, life-changing God that is hope for all people. And it can have impact on anything you do. Again, I was sitting there last night with friends who completely call themselves for a long time, angry atheists, and the only influence of Jesus Christ they want in their lives was Melody and I. And I'm like, okay. And then the whole time last night, the only thing we talked about was Jesus. <laughs> well, tell me about your church and what you're doing. And then I was just, I was just answering questions. And he said, like, well, that's really interesting. I, I really like what you're teaching about this. It doesn't have any heavy, judgmental, rebuking weight. I'm like, mm, no, Jesus is about grace, and he changes the the brokenness in me and he forgives me because I choose to seek after him and he does the work. You know, there's things that I need to do but it's always in response to what he's done. I've never heard it said like that before. I'm like, well, you're welcome. I only say it like that because my daughter's made me watch Moana about 2,000 times and I just, you start getting these moments of trying to sing every response and like, what's happening? You know, you are this close to doing an exorcism on myself sometimes for that very reason, but praise God, he's still good. 
I want to read two quotes from one of my favorite pastors who is just so great. But before I do that, I'll share a story. The first time I met him, <laughs> I was at Breakforth in Edmonton with my wife <laughs> about three years before we had Max. And he was doing this session, and I'm just, I have a total man crush on Erwin McManus because he's just so, he's, God used him to speak directly into my life. All right, and at the end, you could go and meet and greet. And I'm chatting up his son, who shares the same name as me, and we have this normal conversation. But then I look at this guy, and unintentionally, I go into that, that mode like I was talking about, I get stupid. And I tend to elevate this person higher than myself because of what he's done unintentional, but it's just human nature. So he goes up, and he's got his hand out and he's to shake my hand, and I walk right past his hand, and I put my arm around him while his hand is still extended for a handshake. He's like, okay. And my wife is just like, I'm sorry. He's slow. Oh! So my wife had to play that I was mentally challenged to make this an okay situation. And he did. He was very good at it. Like, would you like another photo? I'm like, Yeah. You know, and I, in the photo, I just looked like a goofy idiot. But anyway, these are a couple of his quotes here. He says, God steers us in the direction of his kingdom, his purpose, his passions. His desire is not to conform us, but to transform us, to liberate us. See, anytime you think about the word to conform, it means to completely compromise and, and let go of all you are to become something new. But Jesus transforms us in the sense of making us new, yes, but not completely dismembering us because there's still something about us that he likes and created in the first place. If everyone lost a uniqueness and individualism, we would all be boring Christians and too many people are acting that way anyway. We need to be creative so we can be usable in multiple situations to become who we are meant to become. The more your identity is rooted in God's value for you, the less you are controlled and limited by what others think of you or what institution says you are to be. The temple limited us, conformed us to its desired image. Jesus freed us from religious institutions to transform us into his image. To become like him in a way where different parts of myself are just amplified and other parts that I've never been able to even scrape the surface on dissipate. My desire is change, which makes it possible for me to have different desires come in for self-control and discipline where there was no ability for that to be there in the first place. And I want it. I'm not just told to do it, but I actually crave it. And that's hope. Far too many people are out there saying, well, I really wish I could come to church. I'm just not good enough. And I'm like, that is the biggest crock of soup I've ever heard. And I'm like, listen, you've been taught bad theology. You know, it's, it's like washing your hands because you've been playing in the mud before you have a shower. It doesn't make sense. Just jump in and get clean. But come as you are. See, Kurt Cobain made that famous in 1994, but the thing is, Jesus said that 2,000 years before Kurt Cobain even thought those lyrics up, but the church has stopped preaching that message of come as you are, because you're loved as you are. Let God do works as you are. Yes, it will get dirty and messy, and there's going to be a lot of challenges that are going to challenge you to think outside of the box you've been living in and really stretch your character and faith. And there's going to be hard situations that come. But it's okay, because you've got support here and more importantly, we've got Jesus. We don't have to go to this building to find him. He's with us every step of the way. Thank God. And it's quite amazing what can happen. Well, I'm uh, out of material. No, oh, thank you. <laughs> as long as the message gets home, there's... there's it's not stuff, it's not buildings, it's Jesus alone. And for him to actually be able to say that in the first place is like, is huge. Jesus, the thing is, is too, far too often you hear this safe, safe gospel where you, you, Christians are PC and they're, they're really going to be understanding in all areas. And Jesus was so radical, as was his cousin, it got them both killed. And he was radical not for the sake of establishing his own political agenda, but actually loving every single person and letting them come to him. It rattled society to its core, and they wanted him dead because of it. And the people that first instilled that death warrant was the people who were in charge of the religious institution of the day. 
It lets you think. And I'm going to, you know, I want to lift up Angie because she really dealt with something this week which I thought was hilarious. But she was dealing with an email with someone who was so belligerent and thought so highly of themselves that everything that Angie said was not good enough and wrong. And I, I called her and thanked her for, for dealing with it as much as she did before she forwarded it to me. And it was funny because I said, well, well, how did that look for you? She's like, well, I was trying to answer this guy's question. He kept asking, you know, what is your, what is your mission statement of your church? And she copied and pasted it. And he said, well, that's not good enough. I'm sorry, that's not good enough. And he wanted more, but wasn't asking specifically for more. He was just putting down the fact that we didn't have more. And he got belligerent towards her. And she said, well, and I talked with Steve. And he said, make it Aaron's problem. And I said, yes, that's what I get paid to do. I, and I, and okay, I did it in a loving but a very direct way. And this, this person's messaging me. And, Hi, I'm Aaron. I heard you had some questions. How can I help? Well, if the person before you could have just answered my simple question, we wouldn't be having this conversation. I'm like, well, I'm talking with you now, and if you have a question, let me know. But I sense there's hesitancy. Why are you not asking a question if you want it answered? Well, I'm sick of getting, being given the runaround. Well, my friend, our church loves you. Christ loves you. I'm sick of the passive aggressiveness you're displaying to my people who I care about. I won't stand for it. If you do have a question, you change your mind and actually want to start communicating honestly, you have my email. Have a great day. <laughs> the thing is, though, people have this expectation, oh, well, you're a pastor. You need to be a doormat. And I'm like, nope. And if you try and step on me or any of my people, I'm going to come at you in a loving way. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to pray because my instinct is to, to pound you into the ground, but I'm going to pray because I don't really think that's what Jesus would do. But Jesus would also say things in a truthful, honest, but loving way that would strike you to the core to the point of you wanting me dead. But the thing is, Angie did good. Because you know what? We're not meant to be doormats. Nobody here is less than anyone else because you come to Christ. And that's the biggest lie the devil can give you. It's false humility, which I suffered with for years. Well, I'm humble, damn it. And I'm just going to serve the Lord. Meanwhile, I'm whipping myself and, you know, praise God, praise God, humble and beating myself to death because this is my humility. If I hate myself, then I can just love Christ and other people. That's not what it's about at all. That's right. Who are we? Sorry, who are we? Children of the King. And Jesus is God, servant of all, hope to the nations, the ultimate sacrifice, so we can be called children of the King. See, Jesus' identity was totally written out in that day and is totally played out in who he was and what he did so that we could become who he meant for us to be. Lord, we thank you for completed work. We thank you for passions, desires. We thank you for your ability and desire to reach us and impact all that we are. Lord, bless us, use us, and help us to become who we are meant to be because of the works that you've done in Jesus' name. Amen.